Hello, this is UCL Uncovering Politics, and this week we ask, what is fiscal transparency? What goes on in government finances? And why is transparency important for government's fiscal performance? Hello, my name is Emily McTernan, and welcome to UCL Uncovering Politics, the podcast of the School of Public Policy and Department of Political Science at University College London. During the recent pandemic, unprecedented public spending was required to help tackle the deadly disease and minimise its economic fallout. But faced with heightened uncertainty, rapidly changing conditions and imperfect information, fiscal transparency was perhaps not at the forefront of politicians' minds when making important public investment and spending decisions. Post-pandemic, in the middle of a cost-of-living crisis and on the edges of a recession, there is a greater desire to understand the government's fiscal position and policies. How well is the government performing? We might ask, where are taxes going? Should we worry about the size of government debt? But as our guests today will explain, when assessing government fiscal performance, we ought not to only consider the liability side of a government's balance sheet in asking about debt. We also need to take a look at government's financial assets. Indeed, the recent string of local council bankruptcies in the UK and a report published in August stating that at least 26 councils in some of the country's most deprived areas are at risk of bankruptcy in the next two years indicates that fiscal performance on this front, at least on the local level, is worrying. And in order to understand exactly what's going on, a degree of fiscal transparency, which refers to the publication of information on how governments raise, spend and manage public resources, is needed. Mike Seiferling is an assistant professor in public finance here in the Department of Political Science at UCL and an expert and former economist at the IMF. So an expert on all things fiscal policy and transparency, he has recently published a new paper which highlights the importance of fiscal transparency for financial performance and the importance of scrutinising financial assets. And I'm delighted to say that Mike joins me now. Welcome, Mike, to UCL Uncovering Politics. Thank you, Emily. I'm delighted to be here. Before we get to the paper, Mike, perhaps we could start by talking about the local council's case in Thurrock. So Thurrock has recently become effectively bankrupt as a council and tried to conceal the bad news about its disastrous investments and avoid public scrutiny. What does this tell us about the policies and incentives, or lack thereof, for councils to be transparent with their finances in the UK? Yeah, this is a really good question to start out this podcast. Um, I think it would be useful for us to take a quick step back and realize that this has been happening for a long time. And this is not the first time that um, governments have made, let's say, risky or wacky decisions when it comes to investments in financial assets. If we go back to the financial crisis in 2008, there were small councils across the world, not just in the UK and not just in the US, where they invest in in mortgage-backed securities only to find out that those assets were toxic and and bankrupted a lot of small councils in Scandinavia and throughout the world. So this isn't the first time that um, local authorities have made decisions where they tried to um, maximize returns on financial assets or maximize returns for their local councils only to find out that those investments didn't pay off in the long run. In this particular case, so it was obviously highlighted and there was a lot of dramatic parts that came with it, including the the private jet and and the solar panels and all of these things. But the the main message we should be thinking about is holding governments accountable in terms of their investments in financial assets. And then there is also a bigger question of, is it a government's role to invest in financial assets? Should it be a private sector thing? You know, if there's a solar panel company and it's a high risk investment, Is it something where the government has sufficient expertise to make those type of investments? And is it in the taxpayer's interest to have governments make those investments? It sounds like from that you think the answer is no. They shouldn't make that kind of investment. Is that your thought or does it depend? It really comes down to expertise. So if you have a council that's made up of people who don't have backgrounds in finance and maybe are not um, well-versed in interrogating balance sheets or interrogating the the future potential of a company and are simply investing off a whim or because somebody in a fancy suit and tie told them that they're going to get rich or they're going to enrich their councils, 
then probably the answer is no. But um, I mean, in many countries across the world, there's different philosophies when it comes to investment in financial assets. In fact, if you look at countries like India and Bangladesh, several commercial banks are, are within the public sector and they do play a role in potentially providing access to finance for those who might not be able to access it in, in a private sector setting. But there's several caveats that come with that. And I think that we can, that kind of centers in on the discussion we're having today about fiscal transparency. So, um, you know, with, with privilege comes responsibility. And if governments are going to be making these decisions, then there needs to be a great deal of clarity for the public to hold them accountable on those decisions. Great. Let's talk a bit about um, how are we going to go about holding governments or local governments accountable? So I, I guess a crucial part of the story is fiscal transparency. Perhaps you could talk our listeners through what's going to be involved in greater fiscal transparency and how it's going to help us hold governments to account. Yes, a very interesting and excellent question, Emily. So fiscal transparency can mean many things to many people. Um, the IMF has an excellent framework that goes over like a fairly um, comprehensive framework that that considers the decision-making process, so procedural side, as well as kind of financial statements, balance sheets, integration of stocks and flows. That's very important to understand the entirety of not just how investments are made, but how those investments perform over time. Um, but transparency, there's probably not an agreed definition amongst political scientists, economists, financial experts, so on and so forth. So I can't give you a definite answer, but... From my personal perspective, I would say that financial transparency should include, it should include both procedural elements, clear balance sheets, clear financial statements, and the performance of assets over time. Um, and I would add one layer to that, for example, in, in the case of local councils, that we should have very micro level data. So, um, sometimes we suffer from, from aggregation when it comes to looking at financial investments or financial positions of governments where you simply get one aggregate figure, let's say for investment in equities, which would still not allow us to go into enough detail to scrutinize what companies does the government own equity in. So, you know, it could be Coca-Cola or it could be, um, or it could be Alphabet or, you know, some, one of these, these companies that potentially is more stable over time or some more risky investments. So we would need to have very detailed data in order to hold governments accountable on each individual investment that they make. And your idea is this should be publicly available. Is that correct? Yes. And not just publicly available, but publicly available in a way that a regular person can understand what it means and how to interpret it so that they can they can follow along with those investments if they if they so choose and they don't need to have a, a PhD in finance to do it. And that will enable the accountability that you were talking about because well, then the citizens will know what's going on behind closed doors. Yes, but there is two sides to that coin. So fiscal transparency in itself is not sufficient. There also needs to be um, members of the public or NGOs or um, fortunate. We're fortunate enough in the UK to have organizations like the OBR and IFS that um, that actually look at that data. So to be transparent is a good thing, but you also need somebody to be looking at that information and to interpret it correctly and to hold um, government accountable on those decisions they make. And is your view that that should predominantly be done inside a country or do you think there's an important role for bodies like the IMF to get involved? I think it's an important role for people who come through the education system, for example, at UCL, we should, in, in departments like um, public policy and, and economics, we should be teaching um, students how to interpret balance sheets, how to interpret financial statements. And to some extent, public sector accounting is, is ignored in universities. Um, if you're in an accounting department, you're generally going to be studying IRFR, IFRS, not IPSAS. And in economics department, you do some national account stuff and, and some introductory accounting stuff, but there's not much depth. And in political science, we were pretty lean when it comes to teaching accounting. So the first step is educating the public in a way that they can they can understand um, the meaning, the story behind the numbers, but also contributing to um, to a wider set of knowledge. So I don't I don't want to have this come across as only universities should be um, providing skills so that people can hold government accountable. My belief is that anybody in any line of work and any level of education should be able to understand the basics of holding government accountable for their financial decisions. 
it's, it can happen sometimes that the language becomes unnecessarily overcomplicated so that um, regular people might, that they, they can't interpret things that are actually much clearer if they're explained properly. And moving away from the case of Thurrock and, and national cases, what about the more wide, so I know a lot of your work has been overseas, so what are the more dramatic and corrupt ways in which governments can behave badly through their management of assets or investments? Oh, this is a great question. So I'll try to keep it limited. Um, there was a case in, I think this was in Iraq, after the, the invasion, um, and it was either the central bank or commercial banks were um so so the the easy part is to do the physical invasion and military takeover and so on and so forth the difficult part is sorting out the mess once you once you're in there um and this this happens in many countries so I don't want to isolate just one but you can find that um going to the the kind of centerpiece of this discussion portfolios of financial assets because they can be so well hidden and they don't appear in high profile numbers like gross debt or even in the deficits. Um, suppose, Emily, that you're my sister and I want to give you a nice gift um, coming from the commercial bank or from the central bank or one of the public sector institutions. The easiest way for me to do this without being caught is to um, give you a loan, quote unquote, for $100 million, let's say. And then over time, I simply write that down very slowly. So when you're writing down a loan, um, this will never appear in the deficit. This will never affect the deficit and it will never affect my gross debt. So essentially, unless um, the general public is looking at the portfolio of financial assets and centering in on, you know, who did this loan go to and why does it keep getting written down? Then essentially, I can just give you that money. And um, and they found after the invasion of Iraq that forty percent of the portfolio of financial assets were these type of um, these type of loans that were just basically gifts and slowly written down and um, and there wasn't sufficient public scrutiny and this doesn't only happen in one country this still happens to this day um, and you I mean there's several good stories that that we could get into that center around the exact same thing troubling stuff. And I guess, is that less common in the UK context, that very egregious kind? Or do you think that's also happening here? Yeah, I don't know any particular cases. I never want to go on, on air saying that this happens in the UK. I will say this. Um, the bounce back loan scheme in the UK was high, you know, got a lot of high profile attention because uh, five billion pounds were found by the National Audit Office to be um, lost due to fraud. I, I know that this has been contested, but there's several excellent, excellent reports written by the NAO that have gone into great detail on this. And um, and part of that could be attributed to the very um, loosely defined restrictions on those loans and the very favorable conditions that were given to commercial banks to provide those loans. So we did lose, according to the NAO, five billion pounds of, of, um, of funds, which in the context of current day government where we're tightening our belt, and, um, and, and a lot of public sector employees feel like they're being underpaid. That's a huge amount of money that shouldn't be, um, under, understated. So these, these kinds of things happen. Um, fraud happens. And in lots of cases, it, it's, it's part of the financial asset side of government's balance sheet. Or in the case of the UK, we would consider this a contingent liability that materialized. Um, and, and, to be fair, enriched the commercial banks while, while defrauding the public sector in the UK. So there, there are things that defraud the general public from funds that could have gone to better places. And this can be done in a variety of ways in a variety of contexts. That is absolutely fascinating. What an extraordinary amount of money we're talking about. Now we've got that motivation set in the background. I wonder if we can get to grips with your paper. So in the paper, your focus is on the performance of government portfolios of financial assets. And we can now see why that's of such interest. And you evaluate the relationship between these government portfolios and fiscal transparency. So just to make sure that we're on exactly the same page, what do the government's balance sheets consist of? And how do our financial assets fit into them? Obviously, we've touched on that already. But let's just get really concrete. Yeah, it. okay, very good. Um so if we, if we, there's two different ways to think about the performance of government. One is to look at how they make decisions over time. So Emily, you already mentioned tax and expenditure. 
Um, and those two together will determine your deficit. And this is one high profile figure. So we can think about this as, um, suppose that, that you're coming to, to UK to, to study, um, and you have some income, but you're limited in, in terms of how much you can work and your expenditures that weigh that. Then over the course of the year, you, you run a deficit or you need to either borrow some money or draw on your savings to finance that thing. So that's kind of how we can think about a deficit. But then the other way we can think about a country is in terms of its net worth. So net worth would be like a snapshot of how rich are you in net terms, which is in, in very simple terms, how much stuff do you own versus how much do you owe? This concept is, is very interesting from several perspectives. One, if we think about um, who is the poorest entity in the world, the answer is the, the U.S. government by far because the liability side of their balance sheet is is extremely large. And the U.S. is a bit of an outlier in, in that they hold very few financial assets when we compare them to countries in Europe or Japan or so on and so forth. So um, there's different ways of thinking about financial health and financial sustainability. And some advocates would say that we should be thinking about changes in net worth rather than deficits. And deficits is kind of a subset of of, of financial decisions that are made. Um, but part of that changes in that worth may not be attributed to government policies, which kind of obfuscates the, 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 the analysis a little bit. So, um, probably the best approach would be to have, you know, a, a, a one week course for everybody in the UK to understand financial statements, balance sheets, and the integration of stocks and flows. So how, the value of assets and liabilities change over time, which is, is, it's not a complicated thing. And then to have, to have those kind of, um, emerge as a wider picture of financial sustainability, financial health, and so on and so forth in the UK. Fantastic. And what kinds of assets are we talking about here? So when you say the, the US has very few of the kinds of assets that we see in Japan and in Europe, which kinds of things do you have in mind there? Yeah, excellent, excellent question. So um, we need to quickly differentiate here between, so there's non-financial assets and there's financial assets. Non-financial assets is a very tricky topic because this includes um, forests and trees and fish and bears and um, the Taj Mahal. So um, valuation, obviously, is a huge challenge when it comes to, you know, how do you value a lake? You need to know how many fish are in it, how much is each fish worth, how much is the water worth? Um, I, I went um, several years ago to, to Rwanda and went on the, the gorilla tour in Virunga National Park, which is incredible. Um, and the, the, the ticket to get in was like 750 US dollars. So when they're thinking about um, making a decision between you know, protecting the park, protecting the gorillas, then you can actually get a figure or you can get a number for, you know, how valuable are those things in economic terms? You know, what's the, the, the value, the market value of a gorilla? But, but it becomes very difficult. Although I will say that now that we're moving towards, um, being, let's say more aware, more financially aware of the climate, um, there's more efforts being put into this, but valuing these type of assets is a very difficult and, um, a difficult thing that's a bit of a balance between, you know, uh, science and art, let's say. So this paper focuses only on financial assets, which would mean that, um, we're, we're looking at like equities, loans, debt securities, um, these type of, of things that to some extent we can get a market value just by looking at, at, um, indices or, or, or market, looking at the market as long as there's demand. So they're a little bit easier to track, and that's why we only follow those in these paper. You're looking into f- fiscal transparency in relation to this portfolio of financial assets. It's quite a broad idea. I mean, we've talked about it. We can see why it's really important. How do you go about measuring it in your paper? How should we go about measuring it? What is, what's difficult about measuring it? Is that a better way to frame that question? The first is, so we talked a little bit before about the definition, and I think that's the starting point is you need a clear definition of what is fiscal transparency. Um, and then you would need sufficient amount of information to, um, to create like a nice index or a nice kind of, um, a way to, to, to make it conveniently measurable for a large number of countries over a large period of time. If you wanted to do some kind of statistical analysis, um, there's several very good papers. 
There's one by Hamid in 2006 from the IMF um, who did a measure of fiscal transparency. And then since then, um, the IMF has dedicated a lot of resources, especially within the Fiscal Affairs Department, to um, financial transparency missions where they go and they do a very in-depth diagnostic check for um, individual countries. And they spend several days there with a team of highly talented um, economists. And they write a report that, um, that you could back out. You could create an index by backing out those reports. Um, unfortunately, they're not in huge abundance, so you wouldn't have a great sample over a long period of time. But if you want a very rich and detailed analysis of fiscal transparency that covers a, a very broad range of topics, then I would definitely um, say that that's the cutting edge or the gold standard. Unfortunately, there's the trade-off between if you want long time series data that covers lots of countries and very detailed assessment, then you, you kind of have to find a middle ground there. Which is what you did in the paper. You in in a sense, down. yes. 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 Great. And your data set that you chose, last question on the methods of the paper before we get to grips with the finding, the data set you chose ends in 2020. So given the unprecedented nature of government finances in 2020, why did you include it in your paper? Very good question. Um, so I would, I would say more so, why did we cut off at that point? Mm. Um, I think that the data that we used in the paper, there's no big jumps at the end point. Um, but we did explicitly try to cut off any COVID data. But there is, so I just give one plug to another paper and, um, and to a, a very interesting database that's been produced by the IMF on COVID financing. Um, there's a, a, an IMF database that's over a hundred countries that looks at measures that were taken by government, financial measures taken by government to finance COVID that's broken down into health spending, non-health spending, um, and then financial measures like loans, so on and so forth. So we talked about uh, the bounce, bounce back loan scheme, which would be a contingent liability. And this is concluded in the database. Um, and this is a current research project of mine that's looking at the role of um, trust and whether it costed more money for governments to um, to encourage people to lock down that were less trusted. Um, so, so going back to your question, the slight tangent there, um, we tried to either control for or not include periods where there was exogenous um, shocks because the, period, the, the point of the paper is to look at the performance of financial assets in, in normal times, not when um, exogenous shocks are, are forced upon a country and it has nothing to do with um, policymakers' decision-making. Is your sense that these shocks lead to a decrease in fiscal transparency or do we not have the evidence that would let us know that yet? One could imagine that governments are maybe a bit more rushed and a bit less careful and a bit less good at being clear about what they're doing during these periods. Or Yes, I would say that governments, could, from a political perspective, it would be a good opportunity to say we're too busy with other things and, um, you know, financial statements and balance sheets are not important right now. We're concerned with safety and, you know, all these terms that... Um, that allow governments to sometimes do some sneaky things. And, and decisions are made in haste. So with the bounce back loan scheme, you have this kind of trade off between you need to provide liquidity to these, these small businesses that are suffering. Um, and you need, and to households as well that are, that are locked down. But you also want to do it in a responsible, in a responsible manner. Um, and my feelings on, on things like the bounce back loan scheme, there could have been definitely much more transparency. So for example, I can go on company's house this afternoon and register a company. And, and during this COVID era, during the, the kind of madness that was taking place, if I can manufacture a company, um, and have kind of some good, some believable records and I approach a commercial bank and say, you know, I need this loan to cover my employees and so on and so forth. Um, there was, there was 100% incentives for commercial banks to provide me that loan and 0% incentives for um, commercial banks not to provide me that loan based on their own financial returns and regardless of whether um, I'm fraudulent or not fraudulent. So I think from that perspective, I saw in the newspaper today that one of Labour's new pledges is that they're going to try to chase down this $5 billion of fraudulent money. And in order for them to do that, they would need some very detailed and transparent information on who took out these loans um, and then they would need to investigate those on a case-by-case -case basis. So I think during financial crises or any other crises, financial transparency becomes even more important 
but is easier from a political perspective to say it's not our top priority until um, in hindsight we realize that we got robbed. And that Labour policy, I take it you think that's a good policy? They should go look. Well, I think it's in, it's it sounds nice, but it's it's much more difficult in practice to do these things than it is to say these things. So, you know, for me to say five billion pounds is 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 a five billion pounds lost is a bad thing. You know, that sounds nice, but to to track down um, to track down where it went and find who are the legitimate actors and who are the fraudulent actors. And, you know, some of them are probably no longer in the UK. Some of them are, 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 you know, all over the world, maybe at this point. So I think it would be nice to see what strategy Labour is planning to employ in order to successfully get that five billion pounds back. But it would be wonderful if they could. Let's turn to your findings. So you find, amongst other results, that fully transparent governments are expected to generate around 7% higher returns on their equity portfolios than fully opaque governments. What's the causal mechanism there? So part of we could look at this as a procedure. If governments know in advance that that their portfolio, their financial portfolios are going to be scrutinised by the public... And we go back to the example of, let's say, Emily, you're my sister or my wife or whatever, and I give you this loan for a hundred million pounds. If there was sufficient transparency, then some media outlet would potentially catch on to that. And we both know that would be a front page paper, right? So if I'm a senior official and then we, we discover that, um, you know, Emily, my daughter, sister, wife, whatever, has received this massive loan from the government, um, there would be a lot of speculation and um, and I would probably have to back out of that thing at some point. Whereas if there's absolutely no scrutiny, then you basically just received a free gift of a hundred million pounds. So the return on, on that type of transaction or that type of financial contract is, is zero. I've lost, I've lost everything. Whereas, you know, if I'm investing in, in say, some blue chip stocks or something like that, and I'm getting, you know, three, four, five, whatever percent, or right now debt securities and you're, you're getting five, six percent. Um, so you can see how those differences kind of merge. And the causal framework is that when governments know that they're being held accountable, they're less likely to make investments that are essentially not investments and, and gifts. And those costs, um, a huge amount of money. And that's the main point that we were trying to emphasize here is just the sheer amount of money that the lack of transparency and, and how that allows politicians to make decisions that are not in the public interest, um, how much that can affect the public purse. Fantastic. Were you expecting this finding? Did you expect to find such a clear benefit from fiscal transparency? No. No, and I, I would caveat this in saying that the countries that we looked at in this in this paper, it's a truncated sample because countries that didn't report any financial data um, are obviously not included. So if you don't report anything, then we can't include you in a statistical analysis. So to be fair, Emily, probably the worst performing or the least transparent and the um, potentially most um, um let's say less least financially responsible countries are simply not in our database. So this finding I think is, is a good gateway to push other academics and other members of the general public to, um, to push for data in their own home countries or to push for more detailed data in their own home countries in order to prevent things like Thurik happening again in the future, which probably will. That was an absolutely fantastic introduction to fiscal transparency, the nature of government finances internationally and nationally. So we've been looking at Mike's paper co-authored with Shamshuddin Tarek. It's called Hiding the Losses, Fiscal Transparency and the Performance of Government Portfolios of Fiscal Assets. It's available now in Public Finance Review. And as ever, these details are in the show notes for this episode. Next week, we'll be looking at all things immigration with some of our subject experts in the department. We'll be exploring the state of immigration research, what we know and what we don't, as well as specific projects that our colleagues have been working on. Remember, to make sure you don't miss out on that or other future episodes of UCL Uncovering Politics, all you need to do is subscribe. You can do so on Apple, Google Podcasts or whatever podcast provider you use. And while you're there, we'd love it if you could take a moment of time to rate or review us too. I'm Emily McTernan. This episode was researched by Alice Hart and produced by Eleanor Kingwell-Banham. Our theme music is written and performed by John Mann.
This has been UCL Uncovering Politics. Thank you for listening. <laughs>